you are ready to teach your high school chemistry students about the concept of average atomic mass of a given element in the periodic table. There are tons of resources out there online, including a YouTube video like this one from the Organic Chemistry Tutor. It tells you exactly, step by step, how to determine the average atomic mass, in this case of the element iron. You probably have a lab that's ready to roll, a lab that may involve beans, and students are instructed to determine the atomic mass of beanium. But something's keeping you from doing exactly this, providing them with a table like this one, which shows the students step by step how to follow the procedure and end up with the atomic mass of beanium. In this video, I'm going to show you how I turned a cookie cutter style lab, like the original Beanium lab, into an inquiry based investigation that involves more thinking by your students, hence the brain shape frosting on these cookies. It does require that your students have some background when it comes to atomic number, mass number, atomic mass, and the subatomic particles. So once you've taught them about protons, electrons, and neutrons, you've reviewed with them their respective charges, as well as their respective masses. One for protons, zero for electrons, and one for neutrons, which leads to some very basic math that a mass of one plus a mass of zero equals a mass of one. And obviously, a proton is really the same mass as a hydrogen atom. That would be the isotope hydrogen 1. But then, how come the periodic table shows instead a mass of 1.00784u, atomic mass units? There's a difference between the mass number and the atomic mass. How can students reconcile that difference? This, of course, requires that your students understand about isotopes, like these three hydrogen isotopes. And if we compare the mass numbers, 1, 2, and 3, to the atomic mass, it makes sense that only a small proportion of deuterium and tritium make up the naturally occurring sample of hydrogen atoms. But how could we help students determine themselves through inquiry-based learning how to determine the atomic mass of a given element, like, for example, the element hydrogen. So I start with the following question, which I present to them on a Pear Deck slide. What is very relatable for students is to envision themselves within a classroom. Let's say 25 students in a classroom. 23 students have a score of 90. Two students score a 61. And so when I asked my students, can you now determine the weighted average based on these two sets of grades for this given classroom, my students had no problem to figure this out. As you can see, it's simply a proportion. 23 out of 25 students scored a 90. 2 out of 25 students scored a 61, which comes out to a weighted average of 87.68. But let's now extrapolate that example to, say, the element carbon. Why did I choose carbon? Well, remember, it's carbon-12 upon which the atomic mass unit is based. These are my own made-up values because I felt that students would be more familiar with carbon-14. Carbon-14 is so rare that this proportion shown here does not represent the percentage out there in nature. Again, most of my students did not really have a problem with this next question, showing 23 out of 25 that had a mass of 12 versus 2 out of 25 with a mass of 14, showing a weighted average of 12.16 U. Again, this does not match with the atomic mass in the periodic table. But here is where the trouble started, and that is when I asked them to write a general formula for each of these questions, a general formula for the calculation and explaining why their answer that they computed actually makes sense. Here I'm showing you my wording of a formula, and the term abundance was definitely a struggle for my students. They were more familiar with words like proportion or ratio. Proportion and ratio are terms that they are more familiar with 
from their math classes. I leave this slide up on my screen and then I send my students over to the lab tables to actually figure it out with the bag of beans that I gave them. The only instructions that they're getting from me is determine the atomic mass of the Mach element benium. Record all your measurements in a title data table so they have to construct the table and show all your calculations. I'm being honest, many of them were struggling. I had a couple of students do something very interesting. They took their beans, they did not sort them, they placed all the beans on the balance, weighed them, divided it by the total number of beans, voila, there's the average mass of a bean. Well, why can't it be done this way? This simple method, however, does not give you all the information that we can extract from the procedure involving the weighted average. Dumping all the beans in one cup doesn't tell you the count in each sample. It also does not tell you what the mass is for each given bean type, whether it's the smaller dark beans, the larger brownish beans, or the little white ones with the black eyes. How did my students do in the end? I will confess, it definitely took them longer to do the lab, the inquiry-based method, because they really had to think through every single step. Did they do it correctly right away? No. They were definitely engaged in getting to the final answer. One extension could be that you transfer this data to Google Sheets. The benefit of Google Sheets is that you can then easily turn the data into two different pie charts. One chart that shows you the percent abundance of the benium isotope. The bottom pie chart shows you the atomic mass contribution but in a percentage form. So when the students are asked which isotope, which type of bean contributes most to the overall atomic mass of benium, they can answer it the following way. The purple beans contribute most to the mass despite that they are the least abundant. And why is that so? Because in terms of grams per bean, they have the highest value. Upon completion of the atomic mass of a benium lab, I have my students answer the following few questions. One of them concerns the element lithium, and the second question involves the modeling of the two lithium isotopes. What you're seeing here are my student models and calculations that reflect what they've learned from the Benium lab, involving lithium-6 and lithium-7, each containing three protons, but a different number of neutrons in their nucleus. In conclusion, I've showed you here the atomic mass of a Benium lab, how a cookie cutter lab can be turned into an inquiry-based investigation, following the next-gen science standards as well as the New York State science learning standards. If you're interested in any additional science lab resources from me, simply go to the link below in the YouTube description. In exchange for your email, you will get the link to this Google Doc. Thank you very much for watching. Bedankt voor het kijken. Tot ziens and see you in the next video.